I made this manuscript up two weeks ago. I'm not going to use it. <laughs> Today, we talk about prophets. Do you know, have any idea, that each of you are prophet? Every one of you. Every single one of you. And I say that because each of you has a story to tell. Each of you has experience to share. History to bring to light again. Today in our gospel lesson we hear the story of an interesting personality of Holy Scripture. One who didn't necessarily dress according to Abercrombie and Finch. Uh, nor uh, ate a menu from uh, the Ritz or someplace like that. A story of John the Baptizer, who Scripture and biblical scholars confer on him the, the role of a prophet in, in the ministry that, that he did in the region around the Jordan River. And if you can, in your mind's eye, imagine a setting where you've got this character running around by a stream of flowing water, which is about eight inches to a foot deep, and railing, if you will, at the crowd of people that had gathered to hear his message, whatever that message may have been, but him trying to get that message over the din of side conversations that are going on everywhere around. And, and I, I can just imagine that probably one of the banes of being a prophet, if you will, is are the people hearing what I'm saying? Are they paying attention? Do they even care? Well, I'm going to cast forward now to kind of a current time of my time at, at St. Crispin's. And when I was a dean of the camps that dealt with middle schoolers from the age of about 11 to 14. And you can imagine, and for those of you who are parents, what that must have been like, you know. But in this setting at St. Crispin's, it wasn't just two or three. It was 60 or 70 of these kids, you know, gathered in a single room. And the leader of the camp session is trying to get to the point of talking about the lesson of the day, if you will, or something that the, uh, the dean of the camp felt important for the kids to know. But all of a sudden, you, you're realizing that you've got 70 tweeners out there that are over here talking. Well, did, can you really kiss a girl with braces? <laughs> you know? Or, or what, what about... Look at this shirt that my mom sent me to camp with this damn shirt, you know, and all of these different kinds of conversations going on, not to mention the cell phones, you know, so where is the tension? Where is the attention span? And all of this din, you know, is going on and the speakers ready to make their presentation. So we developed a method to bring some calm to an otherwise unruly setting. The leader would simply, in silence, raise their hand. And after a while, the kids would look and see the leader with a hand raised. They, too, would begin to raise their hand and stop talking. And after a while, the entire room had their hands raised, and there was no one talking. And then the leader could impart those words of wisdom to the youngsters. Now words in and of themselves are powerful. And words, when you really stop and think about it, are probably one of the most powerful tools that you and I have as not only people, but as prophets. Because the words that we speak are heard. And people who hear those words respond in kind. 
confusion. So the words that you speak, I would caution to use and select them very carefully. Now the words that John the Baptist was sharing were words that he had heard from a prophet from centuries earlier than he, from this one Isaiah. Well, he's talking about to change a lifestyle and to make yourself a place wherein the creator God can abide and to live and to manifest itself within you and how you project that to a larger audience. And it's through those words that those messages are given and exchanged. But then, when you're sharing those words, invariably, there's someone in the crowd that will say, well, how do we do that? And John was no different. His experience was exactly the same because people asked him, well, how do we make the rough places smooth? How do we make something straight that's crooked? How can we bring the high places down to where people have access? Valid questions to the message that he was bringing to those people. Then the words that he chose were chosen very carefully in a manner in which the people could understand what he was talking about. He would say to one group, well, what do I, how can I do that? Well, if you have two coats, give one of them to somebody who doesn't have one. If you have enough food on your table for your family, how about sharing some of that with someone who doesn't have any food? Then the tax collectors, well, what do we do? Well, John's response was very straightforward. Only exact the tax that is supposed to be exacted. No more. And then the soldiers, what do we do? Be happy with your pay. He responded directly to their questions with words that they could understand. And that's why I suggest to us this morning that each of us are prophets in our own right. The words that we choose to share with others and either making a point or participating in a conversation, those words are heard and they're responded to in kind, usually. Now, about those tweeners, and I'm talking time frame of the scenario that I gave in the late 70s. Those tweeners who were tweeners then are now, I can count on two hands, priests in the church, deacons in the church, attorneys in their communities, physicians in their communities, because they heard those words. And however they chose to interpret them or to define them and to make that and incorporate into their system allowed them to not only succeed in life but to carry that same message that they heard then into the community of today. And those words are still as valid today as they were then. And oh, by the way, one of those tweeners opened a place called the Mercantile. Amen. 